Hi, all. Uh, this week, I'm going to be sending out a video of me talking about the company that I covered, um, mainly just because I know that these reports are long, and uh, I want to send out a video because I understand that video content is extremely digestible. Uh, so this week, I covered American Outdoor Brands, uh, and I think it's a buy, but this is not investment advice, just to clarify. Uh, the investment thesis is as follows. American Outdoor Brands is currently undervalued compared to their growth rates. Uh, their favorable financial stack and positive industry outlook all support this, uh, that you're getting pretty much a really good value on this company uh, via the, you know, robust growth. Uh, so simple valuation technique, um, just 14 million shares outstanding. They got $45 million in cash. Uh, cash over share works out to be $3.24. I'm going to go ahead and remove this uh, from our valuation because uh, we're not we want to value this company based on uh, its operations and the cash that they already have is essentially, you know, we get that when, we, when we're when buying the company. Uh, so current price of American Outdoor Brands is $25.91, removed to $324, uh, and you get $22.67 per share. Um, now, the company is trading at about 10 to 14 PE ratio, uh, and this is when you take an EPS range of uh, $2.28 a year. Uh, to a dollar sixty six, and this this range that we got is from their uh, updated guidance from the last quarter. Uh, they updated the fiscal guidance and boosted revenues that they expected to receive uh, by about ten fifteen percent, I believe. Uh, just a quick quote to, from Peter Lynch to throw in here, uh, just to kind of get us thinking the same way uh, when he's looking at, at shares, uh, stocks, and individual companies. Uh, when revenues are growing far faster than the PE ratio, it's always a good sign. Uh, that's not a direct quote, but that's a rough quote from uh, Beating the Street. Uh, so now we're going to go into the bit quick background with the company. Uh, American Outdoor Brands was spun off from Smith & Wesson Company uh, in August 2020. Smith & Wesson Brands still owns 100% of A American Outdoor Brands. Uh, this is significant in and of itself, and here's the reasons why. One, uh, the Smith & Wesson Brands wants to, su wants to see American Outdoor Brands succeed. Uh, two, and more importantly, American, uh, Smith & Wesson Brands believes that they can create more value for themselves by holding on to American Outdoor Brands and having these guys operate as an individual unit uh, and develop individual brands versus selling them off right now uh, to like a private equity buyer or, or something. Um, so at the spinoff, Smith & Wesson Brands capitalized American Outdoor Brands with $25 million. Uh, American Outdoor Brands has been operating for three months now, so what we got here is $45 million in cash as of the last quarter uh, when they released earnings. Uh, and so they were capitalized at 25 mil. That means that they, they, they generated around $20 million just from operations, which is significant. Um, now, the company growth strategy that is propelling, uh, you know, this whole thesis is uh, going to be as follows as well. It's called the dock and lock strategy. Uh, the company has over 20 consumer brands with four brand verticals, Adventure, Harvester, Marksman, and Defender. Uh, these are all these are all brand verticals uh, targeting rugged outdoorsy type people from fishing, hunting, uh, to camping, uh, and et cetera. Um, but the idea here is to bring individual brands and from niche to known. And so we're going to talk about a case study really quickly. Uh, one of those, one of these brands that they were successful with in implementing the strategy was called Bubba Knives. They rebranded that to Bubba. Uh, Bubba Knives was originally just a red fillet knife. Uh, I, funny enough, I'm not that much of a fisherman myself, but I did get my dad this specific knife because he likes to go fishing for Christmas about five years ago. But after requiring the company, uh, American Outdoor Brands then rebranded the, the specific brand from Bubba Knives to Bubba. And then they started to offer more products across that specific niche. Um, for example, they went from that one red fillet knife in, to sell fisherman gaffs, nets, apparel, tackle management, fillet sets. Uh, success here was incredible. Re revenue grew 100% in 2020. Uh, we see this again with another one of their brands, uh, Bog Pod, renamed to Bog. Uh, similar trend here, uh, Bubba Knives, Bubba. Uh, so basically, Bog Pod uh, is a hunting, a hunting product. Uh, originally, it was selling monopods, bipods, and tripods for uh, cameras for hunting. Uh, but after the American Outdoor Brands acquired the company, they rebranded it, developed more product lines across the niche, and now the product lines are consisting of cameras, hunting blinds, camera pod connection accessories, uh, all good things. We, we like this idea that the company can release a lot of different products, hopefully with a stronger gross margin, uh, in order to drive value for us as holders. Uh, so Bog's total sales increased 200% in fiscal year 2020. So, so far we've seen that the niche known approach is extremely successful in capturing a higher percentage of their target market's wallet. 
um, continued growth in these lines and having success with niche to known is what is it going to promote a, and create a, a really valuable company for us that we would like to own in our portfolio. Um, you know, higher EPS will be then will therefore be awarded with a higher PE ratio, and ideally we make money on this company. Uh, but uh, this is not investment advice. Um, so it is interesting, though, to note that uh, new products defined as any SKU not shipped in the comparable quarter last year represented 13% of sales, total sales, uh, for the most recent quarter. Uh, that's significant for two reasons. Um, the total sales from year over year uh, grew a lot, and the fact that the new products are representing 13% of the most recent year's uh, sales means that they're having tremendous success um, with these new products that they're launching via the, you know, the niche to known uh, strategy. Um, industry macro trends are all looking good. Uh, 2020 actually increased the TAM here, the total addressable Mac market. Um, but here's, here's the following information. 46% uh, of campers started camping for the first time after a long time. Uh, I don't know where, where they got that, but that was in one of the reports that I was reading. Uh, but take that with a grain of salt. You don't know 100% uh, exactly how, how uh, accurate that number is. But this number is very accurate because they have to file with the government. Um, Eight million new firearm holders entered the market, and 40 of which are first-time gun owners. Um, that's good. We want to see that because that means that their total addressable market's growing, new, new customers, clients coming in. And if the brand's successful, like we want them to be, well, then they're going to have a pretty easy time converting these people into long lifetime customers. Uh, one, more, one more thing on the whole growth of the total addressable market is that there are 3 million more fishing licenses sold in 2020 than the year before. That's a 14% increase. Um, quickly going to talk about the financial results. Uh, just talk about the improvements of profitability post spinoff uh, and then how it compares across the industry. And then we'll wrap up this video because I don't want to make it too long. But uh, what's important to notice here is that in this quarter, uh, they grew sales 90% uh, year over year. E-commerce channels grew 129%, while brick and mortar channels grew 70%. So I believe that this year, for sure, uh, if not next quarter, e-commerce will take over the, uh, the lion's share of revenue. And this is a good thing. I don't want this company to have to rely on debt-ridden uh, brick and mortar stores in order to sell their products. Uh, it also, if we see growth in the e-commerce product line, it kind of supports the thesis that these brands are individual. Uh, they all have their own website, but they're drawing people in because they they resonate well with the consumer. Um, next, we see clear profitability in the spinoff. Uh, I grabbed this from the 10Q. Uh, gross margins year over year improved 110 basis points. But this is what's really interesting here, and uh, this is why I decided to add this to the boys. Gross margins increased 810 basis points, primarily because of favorable product mixes and lower promotional expenses driven by increased product demand. So if they were able to take like net, net, total net, they were able to take 110 basis points home to the uh, income statement. But um, there were some decreases in the profitability as well. Uh, these increases were offset by 590 basis points. So that's a lot right there. Um, and that they said it resulted from higher tariff costs. So specifically, if that had something to do with China and uh, the Trump regulation, I think we could see Joe Biden removing that. And if they do, then the stock will probably dominate the earnings that people are expecting. Because who would think that American outdoor brands is uh, extremely uh, exposed to tariffs for China? Um, and then B, though, this is what I think is very important, though, from a, a risk side is that they did note some slower moving inventory uh, to certain strategic retailers at discount that generated lower gross margins. So I don't want to see any of that. Uh, if you're if I start seeing a lot of inventory build uh, jump in accounts receivable without seeing uh, the similar growth in sales or a, frankly a far higher growth in sales, then that that might be a, a case for you know maybe that it's not going to achieve what we thought it was going to achieve and we're going to sell the company. Um, but yeah, that and then just to just to wrap it up, uh, American Outdoor Brands uh, they post a horror, higher ROIC than uh, American Sports uh, Outdoor outdoors academy um and then dicks as well so they're posting the highest roic out of all three of these companies um for example they're 13 which is good 
uh, especially compared to ASO, who's boasting an ROIC of 6%. So like, even if these other companies were pursuing growth, uh, they're just going to be expanding an inefficient operation where you're going to be better off just receiving dividends from uh, these companies rather than seeing it reinvested to grow. Uh, but with American Outdoor Brands, 13% ROIC is pretty good here. Um, I would like to see them use some of that debt, bring down their average cost account, uh, bring down their WAC, uh, so that we can experience more benefits as shareholders ourselves. Um, finally, EBITDA margin, highest in the, highest in the industry. Um, I think that's because of rent. Uh, they don't have any brick and mortar stores. They're selling brand line products and they're trying to develop these brands. I like the strategy. Uh, so they have a 15.5% 15 15 EBITDA margin, while Dix and ASO have around 8%, 10%. And finally, their net income margins double that of ASO and Dix. Uh, so that's good. We, we're going to see that cash coming back to shareholders' equity uh, for the company to reinvest at that hot, high ROIC. So this story kind of works out nicely. Uh, you have a total, you have TAM growth, uh, just the amount of outdoors activities triggered by 2020 COVID-19. Uh, you have growth rates of around 90% quarter over quarter. Even if they fell half that, uh, the P ratio is still at 14, 14, 10 if you remove cash. Um, so there's a lot of room for that to run up. Uh, their strategy is just being just being uh, acted on. They're, so far, we've had two extreme successes, and they have 20 other brands to go. So the growth is going to be occurring for a long time. Uh, and... So far, I just think that this company is a pretty strong company, and I think it's it's a buy. Uh, but once again, this is not investment advice. And this went over longer than I thought it was going to be, but thanks again for listening.